Well, we've been in the book of Romans for some time, and we are finishing this great great section of Romans, Romans 9 through 11 this morning with a doxology appropriately spoken and written by the Apostle Paul. Our passage is Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became His counselor, or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word, and may He bless us as we study it together. Let's pray. Father, we do pray Your blessings upon us as we do that. We pray that uh, You give us an understanding of the things that we have read. It's not a long passage, but it is filled with truth that we really can't cover in just 40, 45 minutes of instruction and contemplation. It's a great statement of worship from the Apostle Paul to you. And <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that you would instruct us in it. We, uh, we were privileged this morning to simply be able to come together <clears throat> as we have done as a congregation and read the Bible freely. What a but a privilege and blessing that is. It's not something that everyone has in this world. And you've blessed us and we thank you for that. Pray for this nation that uh, such blessings and privileges would continue for, for many, many years uh, to come and that the church would be strengthened in that, that blessing and privilege. And this is the only way in which we will be strengthened. It's as we read your word, your inerrant word, and we consider it seriously and seek to plumb the depths of uh, whatever passage it is that we're studying. And certainly this one, as I say, is deep and we can only scratch the surface of it. And I think the Apostle Paul would have agreed with that and said, after giving this great doxology, I've just begun to scratch the surface. I can't even begin to fathom the things that I'm saying. In fact, that is what he says. So Lord, our strength is going to be in this this book. In the Bible, the scriptures, all 66 books contained in it. And so as we study it, as we avail ourselves of the blessing and privilege that we have as a church, we will grow and we will be strong. And so we pray that you'd never allow us to forsake that great principle and truth. We would be men and women of your word, of the book, and that we would study it diligently. And that you'd bless us in this hour as we do that, that you would open our minds to understand the things that Paul says here and that we would be sanctified through it, and we would be conformed to the image of Christ through it, and that you would fit us and equip us for the day and the week to come. This is how we are, equipped for life and all of its challenges, and and it's full of challenges, and some are of a crushing nature. You wonder, how can a person stand up under the difficulty, the tragedy, the challenge that he or she may have, have experienced, and yet, We know this life is supernatural, the Christian life, and this book is unique. It is supernatural, and it feeds our soul, and it strengthens our soul, and as we feed on it, as we learn it, we are able, by the work of the Spirit of God within us, to to make wise decisions and to endure under crushing experiences, and all of that to your glory. And that's what Paul will say. So Lord, bless us as we study, strengthen us, uh, create within our hearts uh, receptiveness 
and enable us through our understanding of the things that we have read to give glory to you. Not only in this hour, but in the hour to come in the Sunday school classes and then again this evening as we come back to this auditorium to remember your son and his work on our behalf. We thank you for him. We wouldn't be here apart from his sacrifice for us. Lord, your, your goodness not only saves us from eternal destruction, but you bless us in the meantime. You bless us in this life and you've instructed us to pray for such things as our daily bread. And so we do. We pray that you bless each of us with whatever we need in this life and the material things of this life that you would provide for us and that you would give us the faith to wait upon you to make provision and not act impulsively or unwisely, but we trust you and we pray that you would, in the meantime, show us your hand of blessing wherever that is, is needed in the case of those who are sick or discouraged or facing trials at work or maybe they're without work. Whatever the situation is, Lord, we pray that you would bless and pray for Larry Music as he recovers from surgery. We thank you that he's doing well and pray that he will recover completely. We pray for others, Lord, who, whose names aren't even mentioned, which would include all of us, really, because we all face something. And if we don't see it dramatically in the moment, it certainly will come at some point. We must all go through a dark valley. And I pray that you'd equip us for that. And when we do, that you would support us and sustain us. And if any are here going through that and we don't know about it, we know that you know and pray that you would bless them. Well, bless us, Lord, as we continue in this service. Give us hearts that are receptive to your truth as Paul prayed for the Ephesians and open the eyes of our heart, enlighten our hearts that we would know your truth and apply it to our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. A number of years ago, my wife and I visited friends in Switzerland and spent a few days with them at their summer home high up in the Eastern Alps. Uh, they are Swiss. And so while I was there, I picked up on a few German words. And the one that stuck in my mind was the word schön, which means beautiful. And my wife tells me whenever I say it, I completely mispronounce it. So if you're German, I apologize. But I think the occasion was I looked out the window and I said, that's beautiful. And the woman said, schön. So I repeated it, and so all through the few days we were there, I'd say that word. It became fixed in my mind. When we left, we took a bus down the mountain to town where the train station was, and we traveled on. But on the way down, an older couple was sitting in front of us, and they were visiting in German. When the wife happened to look out her window, and she quietly said, shown. Well, I understood what she had said, and I looked out at that moment, too, to see what she was looking at, and there was this majestic view of the sun on the snow-covered peaks. Her response was completely spontaneous. The, the wonder of it just compelled her to say, beautiful. That's Paul's response in these last verses of Romans chapter 11. Like a traveler who has reached the summit of an alpine ascent, wrote the Swiss commentator Frederick Godet, the apostle turns and contemplates. Depths are at his feet, but waves of light illumine them, and there spreads all around an immense horizon which his eye commands. Well, the lofty peaks that the apostle contemplates are what he has written in these chapters we've been studying, chapters 9 through 11, some of the most majestic passages in all of Scripture, all about the sovereign grace of God. 
But no sooner does he begin to reflect on them than he breaks forth in a doxology, a praise of God for the greatness of his salvation. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, who, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. That statement, oh, the depth, is much like shown. How beautiful, how majestic, how glorious, how absolutely beyond words are God and his ways. I don't know if, if Paul thought out this statement or if it, if it came out as a kind of impulsive cry of adoration. I think with Paul's knowledge of Scripture and his knowledge of the Lord that he was certainly capable of such a, a statement spontaneously that it would just come out of him as he thought about these things. But what is certain is the impression these great truths made on him was overwhelming. God's plan of salvation, His method of directing history to its appointed end caused Paul to marvel at the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge. They are deep, he says. Contemplating these attributes is like looking into a deep valley from a mountaintop, but this is a valley that has no base, it has no floor, it is bottomless, it is fathom less. And so he finds that he cannot comprehend it. Not fully. So, so much of, of, of who God is and what he does has not been revealed. We really know so very little. You think about it. That's, that's, that's only logical. We're finite. He's infinite. There's no end to him. There's no beginning. There's no end. We, when we enter into eternity and have minds that are perfect, they'll still be finite. And so we will forever and ever and ever be thinking about and learning about God. And what, what did, Luther, what did uh, uh, John Newton sing about 10,000 years? Well, after 10,000 years, we won't even have begun to scratch the surface. In fact, we'll never have done anything but scratch the surface and we'll be learning more and more about God. We really know so little right now. There's, there, there, so much has not been revealed about Him, but it's not what we don't know, but what we know, what has been revealed that overwhelms Paul and causes this great sense of awe. It is God's wisdom and knowledge in His grace abounding to the restoration of Israel and the salvation of the nations that Paul cannot fully grasp. Wisdom is based on knowledge. And God's knowledge is inexhaustible. He has never learned and cannot learn because He knows everything and always has. He is omniscient. Psalm 139, that's one of the great psalms on His omnipotence and omniscience. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thoughts from afar, David wrote. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. In other words, God knows everything about everything and everyone all the time. He knows the future as well as He knows the past. That's what the Scriptures teach. Oddly, some people today who claim to be evangelicals deny that. They say the future is open to God, meaning the future is open to God as a realm of possibilities. There's all kinds of possibilities and contingencies that like us, God doesn't know which are the right ones. He doesn't know the possibilities that will come to be, and He's learning just as we are. It's a way of denying certainty, and in so doing, maintaining free will. But if God doesn't know the future, Paul couldn't say what He says here. 
He couldn't speak with any certainty. He couldn't say what he has already said, and so all Israel will be saved. He couldn't know that. According to that theology, openness theism or openness theology, God doesn't know the, the future as we say he does. So Paul couldn't make those statements. He couldn't give this doxology. His joy and confidence that what he expresses here are based on the certainty of future events. In fact, the idea that God does not know everything possible and actual as this openness theology teaches is theologically preposterous and biblically unsound. Just read the scriptures. Read again Psalm 139 at your leisure and meditate on it. Or read Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 and 10 where the Lord says, I am God and there is no one like me. In other words, I am not like you. I am wholly other, completely different. I don't learn I know it all, everything. Then he goes on to say, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good purposes. I'm not going to fail anything. What I have declared, what I have, my purpose is going to be established God knows the future perfectly because he's planned it completely. That's how he knows things. He knows what he's planned and he's planned out everything. And he says no one can frustrate that. There is no uncertainty about the future with God. He's omniscient, thankfully. We could have no comfort in this life if he were not. He knows the past, present, and future completely. He knows our weaknesses and how to strengthen us. He knows our enemies. He knows their plans and how to thwart them. He, he knows the difficulties of our circumstances and how to deliver us from them. He knows the future and how to guide us through the present to that future. God is all-knowing and He's all-wise. God knows every person every condition, every circumstance, and His plan for each of their lives. He knows their pl the plan for their lives because He's the one who has established it. He has drawn out a path for each and every one of us individually. And He uses perfect wisdom in selecting and adapting the right means for fulfilling His plan so that his glory and the happiness of his creatures is secured. In fact, it, it is really impossible to separate these two attributes. They belong together. God's knowledge is wise and his wisdom is informed. And nowhere is his wisdom more glorious, dis gloriously displayed than in his plan of salvation and his purpose for history. Humanly speaking, the, the issue of salvation put God on the horns of a dilemma. How to save the world once it had fallen? How is he going to do that? God is love, and God is absolutely just. Amnesty for sinners might seem to be a loving thing to do. I'll just forgive them and forget but that would violate his justice. He'd no longer be a just God. Judgment on sinners, on the other hand, would frustrate his love. So how could a holy God save sinners who deserve judgment and still remain a holy God? That was God's dilemma, humanly speaking, as we would see things. That's a way of putting it in our terms to see this is uh, an insoluble problem in and of itself. And of course, it was never difficult for God. God doesn't puzzle over problems. We put it this way for our own sake to help understand what He has done. He's all-knowing and wise. His plan is eternal and it's revealed in the Gospel. Christ, God the Son, became our substitute. That's how He solved this dilemma. He took our place in judgment so that, as Paul wrote in chapter 3, 
God would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, that is God's wisdom. It solves what would seem to be unsolvable problems. And we see his wisdom in the way he is guiding history to its appointed end. God made special promises of salvation to Israel. He promised the nation a kingdom. And yet the promises seem to have come to nothing. As we look at things today, the Jewish people are largely in unbelief. But all of this is according to God's all-wise plan, as Paul has explained in chapter 11. Jewish unbelief led to Gentile salvation, which will provoke Jewish jealousy, leading to their faith and salvation. That will happen at the end of the age in connection with Christ's return when the Deliverer comes. Then there will be blessing for the whole world, what Paul has called life from the dead. Godet said, this is what no philosophy of history has dreamt of. And that's really what, what Paul's meaning when he wrote, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. God's judgments and, and, and ways are his decisions or decrees, both mean basically the, the same thing, that God's decisions about uh, salvation and the way in which He is working out His will in history is beyond our ability to fully understand. God's ways are uh, paths that uh, cannot be tracked or traced out. We are not able to comprehend God's ways and the paths that our lives are taking. And yet, for his elect, they always lead to a good end, the very end that God has planned and purposed. Paul was on his way to Damascus to kill Christians. How could he have known the Damascus road would lead to Christ? John Newton, who I referred to a moment ago, went to sea and became a slave trader. How could he have known that that dark path would lead to the light of the gospel and salvation? Then there are the, the tragedies that, that touch people's lives and leave us wondering why God allowed that to happen. We don't know. We can't figure all these things out. Those are the secret things that belong to the Lord as Deuteronomy 29 29 speaks of. God's ways are past finding out. They are untraceable for us, but not for Him. He has planned the course of our lives and is guiding our every step according to His inscrutable wisdom. God's work has been likened to that of a weaver making an elaborate tapestry on a loom we can only see the mixture of colors and the design piece by piece as it's woven. The full design is known only to the designer. And it's the same for God's work in history and in our lives personally. We have the Bible and we know something about who He is and what He's doing, but the full picture, the details, all of it as it falls together and is put together is known only to the divine designer. We can't trace it out. Someday we'll know. Someday you'll know why the things occurred in your life that so trouble you. That's what we read in Revelation 7 and Revelation 21, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's when He's going to explain everything and it'll fall into place. But in the meantime, it's unsearchable to us. But we must be searching. We must search the Word of God, the revelation that we have. There's really nothing more important that you and I can do in this life than do that. I know your work is important or your family is important or there are all kinds of things that are very important. I don't deny that. But the most important thing that you and I can do as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, is search the Scriptures, study the revelation that He has given to us. 
There's nothing more important than that. There's nothing more practical than studying God and his ways. It lifts us. It transforms us. But it is a subject that is boundless and beyond us. And Paul confirms that from Scripture in the next verses, verses 34 and 35, with three questions. They are what we call rhetorical questions. They don't really ask for an answer. The, the answer is obvious. They're put in the form of a question to make the point. And again, they indicate that God is beyond our comprehension. He's beyond our control. Verse 34, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became His counselor, or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? Obviously no one. The idea that we could teach or give God anything is patently absurd. And Paul makes that point from a combination of scriptures taken from Isaiah 40 and Job 41. The first two questions are from Isaiah 40 verse 13 where Isaiah describes God's greatness as the creator. He has measured the seas in his hand uh, he's marked off the heavens. He has counted the dust of the earth and weighed the mountains in his scales. As, as, as great as the world is, as great as the heavens are, as great as the whole universe is, and we have a better perspective on that, I would say, now than, say, Isaiah did. In fact, it wasn't until the early part of the 20th century that scientists came to understand that the universe is bigger than the Milky Way. It's only one of a multitude, billions, I think, of galaxies out there. So we have a greater understanding of it, but the point that Isaiah makes and the writers of Scripture make is still the same. These things are small to God. As great as the universe is, it's tiny to Him. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket <clears throat> and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. It, it, substitute the universe for that. God's infinite, remember. Infinite. There's no end to Him. There's an end to the universe, as big as it is. And the, more, the, the greater we see the Lord, the smaller everything else becomes. And it's like a speck of dust on the scales. They are regarded by Him as less than nothing and meaningless. What's so great and important to us when compared to the mind of God and who He is and what He does, all this is just small and meaningless, nothing. God is infinite. So in that context, the question is asked, who has known the mind of the Lord or who, can become, who became His counselor? God cannot be comprehended by us. And God cannot be advised or counseled by us. His works of creation and providence and salvation are His works alone. The question from Job 41 verse 11 is similar. Job and his friends were in a theological debate about God and His ways with men when God finally speaks out of a whirlwind in chapter 38. He silences Job's friends with questions like, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? And where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Those are questions that are very applicable to our day and age. Then in chapter 41, the Lord asks, Who has given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. We cannot give anything to God. Everything is His. Everything we have and possess. Your health, your clear mind, your opportunities in business or in family, whatever. Everything we have, every good and perfect gift is from Him. It comes down from above. So God is dependent on and debtor to no one. Paul affirms that in verse 36 with his comprehensive statement, 
For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Those three prepositions, from, through, and to, state the origin, the ground, and the goal of all things. First, everything comes from God. He's the source of all things. He is eternal. He is self-existent and self-sufficient. He has no origin, no beginning. He has always been and owes his, his existence to no one and nothing, which sets him apart completely from all creation. When he revealed himself to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, he revealed that his name is I am who I am. God always is. The bush itself illustrated that. What you remember caught Moses' eye was that this bush was burning, and that wasn't necessarily a surprising thing out in the desert where these, the heat might cause a, a bush to break out in fire. But this, this bush was burning, but the bush wasn't being consumed. And that caused him to draw close to it. It, it burned independently of the bush. The fire was its own source of energy. God is like that. He is the only independent being and independent will in the universe. We're dependent on everything. Think about it. We might think of ourselves as independent individuals and we, we go our own way and we do what we're going to do, but we are absolutely dependent in every way on the environment for our existence. We need air to breathe. We need the ground to stand upon. We need the food that it produces every day. We need one another for fellowship, for company. God doesn't. Before the worlds existed in all eternity, God was firmly grounded in Himself and sufficient in Himself. He wasn't lonely. He didn't create us to give Him worshipers or company. God is a trinity. We sang about that. It's a great thing to sing about in our first hymn this morning. God is a trinity. He has always lived in perfect happiness and fellowship in the Godhead. He has no origin and no needs. All things were created by Him out of nothing. Ex nihilo. He spoke everything into existence. And He keeps all things in existence. They are all sustained by Him. They are, as Paul says, through Him. Your existence at every moment is because of God, who wills it to be. Paul explained that to the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts 17. He told them who God is, and he said, He himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. He was saying to those philosophers, you know, you're able to be here and think these thoughts that you think and expand your minds as you think you're doing because God enables you. He gives you every moment of life that you have. He gives you every breath. I just saw you breathing. God gave you that breath. You too. All of us. We're all completely dependent upon Him. He sustains us. And that's what He was saying to them. He sustains you. You're able to stand on this hill, Mars Hill, and listen to me because He's giving you that moment, that life. He sustains every one of us. He, is, he sustains the entire universe by the will of His power. And the reason is found in the third preposition. All things are to Him. The reason for our existence is not found in ourselves, in reaching our own goals and finding our own happiness. We were created for Him and we are sustained every moment for Him. That's true of all things. That's true of the entire universe. It is to Him. It is for Him. And that is true in a special sense for Christians. Our, our new birth, our salvation can only be understood in terms of this formula that Paul has written. 
from Him and through Him and to Him. God planned our salvation and chose His people in eternity past. Christ accomplished our salvation in history through His sacrifice. And in each generation, the Holy Spirit applies to the elect, the chosen ones, the work of Christ by bringing them to faith. It's a comprehensive, complete work of the Godhead. And He keeps us saved. We face temptations and dangers daily, far more than we realize. We are in a constant battle. Read Ephesians chapter 6, Paul develops that there. We are in an invisible war. We are living in a continual hail of fiery darts from the evil one. But we persevere through it all because of Him. I don't mean we don't exert effort. We don't apply our minds. We must. We must read the Word of God. And we must apply it. We must seek through prayer the wisdom of God and He will give it. And we must be very active in all of that. But the bottom line is we're able to do even that by the will and the power of God. We persevere because of Him. The perseverance of the saints can be called the preservation of the saints or the perseverance of God with the saints. We do persevere, but by His grace and His grace alone. And in the end, He will certainly bring us His children, His chosen ones, to him forever. I love that doxology that Jude gave in Jude 24. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. And he will do that. That is a certainty. That's not a wish or a hope. That is a certainty. He will do that. And we can take no credit ourselves. All the, the praise and the glory goes to God alone. And that's what Paul says. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Now that was a spontaneous response from the apostle. He was overwhelmed by God. His greatness and grace and wisdom. The wisdom and the grace of His plan of salvation. But his doxology, while it is a natural as I suspect, spontaneous expression of worship is also very instructive for us. It reveals the goal of all things. Everything God does is ultimately to Him. It is for Him. It's to display His glory forever. And that is to be the governing principle of our lives. That we're to live in light of that and for that. That's not just an inference that we can draw from this great doxology, but it's the actual statement of Scripture. The Apostle Paul made that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all the, to the glory of God. That's a very instructive, life-governing verse. Everything you do, from the smallest, most mundane kinds of things like eating, Glorify God. Did you glorify God today when you ate a bowl of cereal? Well, that's something to think about, how we do that. But that's what he says. From the smallest, most insignificant, mundane, common things in life to the loftiest things that we can do, we're to live to the glory of God. I saw a reminder of that in the old city of Heidelberg where there's a beautiful old hotel Originally, it was a mansion built by a Huguenot merchant in um, 1592. I think that date is, is on it. Well, at the top of the building, at one of these ornate gables, in gold letters are the words, Soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. It's not on a church, but a home, and then what became a place of business, which testifies that home life, business life, is holy. This, this isn't the only day of the week that is holy to us. Every day is holy. This isn't the only hour or set of hours that 
are special to us. They're set apart for this purpose, that's true, but your, your whole life is set apart to this very thing, to glorifying God. We're to have Him and His glory as the object of our lives. That is our chief end in this life. That's our purpose. When we do that, when we make that our purpose, when we understand that that is exactly how we are to live, not for ourselves, but for Him, we live the best lives. Because as we follow Him and honor Him, we become increasingly like Him. But how strange that, that, that sounds to us. We are used to thinking first of ourselves and of our own advancement, our happiness. We're, we're programmed, as it were, from all that we hear and what just is naturally within us to seek our own personal glory, set ourselves above everyone else. But the end of that is not blessing. It's misery. Misery. Napoleon was a man who was all about glory. A little over 20 years after France had overthrown its king, it had an emperor. The coronation was in Notre Dame Cathedral. It was spectacular. The Pope himself officiated. But what's interesting about that and all the glitter and glamour of the moment is it was Napoleon who first crowned Josephine and then crowned himself. Not the Pope, not anyone else, but, well, who else but him? He's the greatest of all. So he was his own kingmaker. At the height of his power, Napoleon said, I owe everything to my glory. If I sacrifice it, I lose everything. And so he soaked Europe in blood in order to garner more glory in war and keep his power. But that's the result of personal ambition and glory seeking. Ruin and misery. It's what happens all the time on a much less grand scale in business or in the home or in politics. When men or women seek their own ends for their own recognition and advancement, when we put ourselves first above all things. That's Adam crowning himself king as though he were his own maker, subject to no one but himself. The autonomous man, the self-made, self-directed man. What was the result? The result of that was the fall and hell on earth. We were not made to be worshipped. That's what men want. That's what Adam wanted. He wanted to be God, like God. And when we want to be adored by others, when that becomes our ambition, whether we articulate that in our mind or not, when we live that way, that will result in misery because we were not created to be worshipped. We were made to worship. We were made to glorify God and Him alone. He only is worthy of worship and when we do that, when we honor Him first, we will prosper in life. And we will be blessed, blessed above all others. A.W. Tozer warned, The first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God. That's the danger for a church. That's the danger for a Christian individually. How do we gain a high opinion of God? Well, we gain a high opinion of God by seeing Him, by having a vision of Him. I don't mean some supernatural vision, but having a vision within our minds. We see Him in nature, His handiwork. That's general revelation, or what's been called the big book. But especially and principally, we see him in the Bible, special revelation, the small book, where he speaks to us and he reveals himself. That's what Paul reflected on here, the, the doctrines he expounded in this book, God's power and grace and wisdom that he would rescue man from utter ruin to gain such 
a wonderful salvation. Now, how can you not praise God? He saved us at his own expense. And who did that? The infinite, eternal God Almighty of the universe. He doesn't need us. If the universe is like a speck of dust on his scales, what about you and me in rebellion against him in sin? He could have swept us away without a thought. But he sacrificed his own son for us. That calls forth praise and doxology like we have here. And as Paul himself gives us here, he couldn't contain himself. He spontaneously broke out in a doxology of praise. Oh, the depth of the riches. Paul's not the only one who made a spontaneous cry of adoration to the Lord. I, I, you and I would do it like that if we got this vision of the Lord, as Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6. But Peter did this as well when he had a, an epiphany, as it were, a vision of who this one that he was speaking with really is. After fishing all night and catching nothing, somewhat discouraged, he exhausted himself and the others had, there just was no, the fish weren't biting, the fish weren't coming into the net. And then the Lord said, well, let down your net again. Peter thought, this is a waste of time, but all right. He did it. And when he did, he caught so many fish, the, net, the nets began to break. And Peter, as a result, spontaneously fell down at the Lord's feet and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You are God. I am nothing. In other words, glory to God alone. Now, that's our watchword. It was for John Chrysostom. He was um, one of the great preachers, maybe the greatest preacher of the 4th century and early 5th centuries. His name means golden mouth. That's a kind of description of what a great preacher he was. But his preaching, as I guess all good preaching did and does, angered some people. It angered some people in power. It angered the empress who exiled John to the Black Sea. Oh, the journey was a very hard one, and he was an old man, and he didn't survive it. His dying words were, glory be to God for all things. That is a light to our path, and it should be the desire of all our hearts. God will be glorified in all things. Whether you and I glorify him, he's going to be glorified in all things. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but still he will conquer his enemies. He will remove the wicked from the earth to the glory of his justice. That's a warning to the unbeliever, to anyone who has not turned to Christ. Do so. Flee the wrath to come. How much better... To glorify God as a new creation in Christ, as a display of His great mercy and salvation, salvation that He has achieved alone through the cross of His Son. That is where God's great glory was demonstrated. In the sacrifice of Christ who paid for our sins and obtained for Him His people. All who believe in Him receive that. All who believe in Him at that moment are adopted as His sons, brought into His family as His children. So if you're here without Christ, believe in Him. The moment you do, you will receive from Him forgiveness of sin and life everlasting. He receives everyone who trusts in Him. So trust in Him. And God help you to do that and help all of us to live to His glory alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this great passage of Scripture, this great doxology. And again, we have just begun to scratch the surface and feel so feeble in our attempts to expound it. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the salvation we have in your Son. Thank you for, in eternity past, drawing up the plan of salvation, which was always forever in your mind, and you executed it with perfection and 
in a way that has brought new life to every believer in Jesus Christ, which is a multitude of people beyond counting. Thank you for the abundance of your grace. All the glory goes to you. We say this and pray this in Christ's name. Amen.